Okay, so now we are into part three. Up until this point, we've been talking sort of the build, the instructional foundations that you're creating as a teacher, and sort of the approach that you should take to planning out your course. Now we're going to look at sort of the boots on the ground. What are the detailed elements that educational experts say and studies have shown are the best practices? And really it boils down to student-centered learning. This means that all of the instruction that you're doing is based on the students. I, my goal is to help students achieve, which of course sounds very foundational what we do as teachers, but oftentimes our instructional strategies are more teacher-centered, right? They're more about demonstrating what I know and hoping students can catch up. Student-centered learning means I'm really focused on students moving their way through those goals and objectives, and I'm building my instructional strategies that way. So what's it look like in a class? Let's dive in. So we're going to go through 12 best practices daily strategies. First, the best practice is not to establish your class or your lesson of the day with an objective. That might be a little bit difficult for students to wrap their heads around. Or with just a, uh, a topic, as we often do in our slides, where you just say, okay, today we're talking about supply and demand because I teach economics, I use those types of examples, right? Instead of doing that, we try to develop essential questions, which are key. Uh, it tells the students what the intended goal is, but it establishes it as a question that can be answered, right? And those questions should be multi-skill, right? In order to answer the question, you might have to analyze and apply, for example. And it should have some depth to it, right? By the end of this lesson, they should be able to answer that question, but be able to answer it at variable levels. So some students have a very foundational understanding or beginner understanding of the content. They can answer the question still, but they won't have the same depth as somebody sort of in an advanced stage where they really understand the content very well, right? So just designing your slides, your lessons, your instruction around questions starts to change the focus, right? Instead of focusing on, I have to teach this subject, it's I have to help students answer this question. So it becomes student centered. Utilizing activating strategies is also key. There's lots and lots of ways to do this. You might have heard them as uh, bell work is often what they're referred to as, or uh, hooks is, is often something that we refer to them as, but sort of activating the learning for the student. How do I get students thinking at the start of the class? Uh, there's some great studies about retention strategies where you can have them go all the way back to the beginning of the year and have them answer some questions that were just a process of trying to remember is key. Or you can utilize some pop culture or world connections or current events to kind of engage students and then connect it back to your learning. We've also found that even if you just use something that's interesting and get students curious about learning, that isn't related to your content level, you still have the gains of activating that learning. So why wouldn't you do it? Spend the first couple of minutes of every class finding a way to activate learning. It could be something as simple as having a question and having them churn and discuss with another uh, student, or it could be something as formal as having them answer a question on Canvas, and, or as fun as watching a video or laughing about something. But again, the goal is to help them make connections show what hey you know this you can answer this you can have a level of a success immediately in class and now we're going to build upon that we're going to use that as a bridge to the new content that we're going to cover today next making sure that you define relevant vocabulary it's really important to understand that vocabulary is key to building learning right when students can identify the right vocabulary which is sort of at that knowledge level then when you discuss it further later on, they can add new depth to the understanding of those terms. So making sure that you isolate that important vocabulary. So if you're trying to, what should I have on my slides? Any new definitions, you wanna make sure you get them there and that you're using those consistently. Something that often confuses students that we do, at least I do often, is we have sort of a thesaurus in our brains. So rather than using the same term to describe something, we use a variety of terms. Well, as a result, we're not really building the knowledge of that term. We're not really adding depth to their understanding of it. So utilizing the same term whenever you're referring to something in that category 
and using it in content context is going to build a lot of depth for the student. So identify what that term is and then use it frequently in your instruction and use it in your, your guiding essential questions and use it in your worksheets or in your activities that students are wrestling with the content. Introduce it, help them memorize it, and help them use it. So intentional use. Okay, moving on. Limited lecture. Now, there are some that say you shouldn't have lecture at all. And oftentimes that kind of misses the mark. I think lecture is key because there are few things that signal or signify the importance of something as well as a teacher standing in front of the class teaching that content specifically. And at the end of the day, you should be a master of your own content. And so the depth and the key signifiers of what is important for students, utilizing yourself as an expert every once in a while is key. But we do know that after about 15 minutes, it's important to have some sort of break or some sort of check on understanding because student engagement engagement wanes. So using that as a marker, I think is really important for me as a teacher. Like, hey, can I cut this to about 15 minutes and then have some sort of a break? And then maybe I can come back for another 10 minutes or five minutes if it's, if it's a really new content heavy uh, day, for example. But trying to use that as a limiter and trying to find other ways of getting students to wrestle with the content often results in a better or more successful class that gets us closer to our goal. So intentional breaks in there is, is key. Graphic organizers are huge, right? So students will have to conceptualize learning. That's what we're doing, right? I'm giving them new content. They have to make connections between that content. And oftentimes we're verbally doing that for them in our mini lecture, or we're signifying that for them in the activities that we're asking them to do. But if they're taking notes on my lecture and they don't know what's important or how things connect, it can be really difficult for them to go back to that and use it as a review strategy or to help them get more depth of our understanding, right? So instead, utilizing graphic organizers that signal the connections that you're doing or help them wrestle with the depth of the content or the knowledge can be really, really helpful. So again, this increases student retention and it models studying habits. So it helps them see, and you can kind of move them in the graphic organizers towards that, uh, that, strat, that mastery level that you're asking them to do on that learning objective. So for example, you can have where they take the main ideas or the essential questions on one side, you can have them hypothesize, you can have them take notes on that in the middle, and then on the end, you can give them an activity where they're summarizing or having a new answer to that same question. Again, you've taught the same content, but now it's student-centered, where you're looking at scaffolding that helps every student independently become successful at achieving your goal. Student movement is key. Study after study after study shows that students need to move and moving actually is a great signifier that something is important, but also it's really important for them as a way to sort of exert some energy and connect with other people. So if you can try to find a way for students to move because movement in the classroom when it's intentionally done can signal importance of events and it can highlight. For example, if you are moving from one activity to another, having students move their desk or move to a different part of the classroom can show that transition to them, especially when it's done consistently, and you can use that to signify changes, right? For example, in my, my business classes that I used to teach, I would have teacher instruction at the beginning. So they would sit all facing me. And then I would have them move into collaboration. And when they moved into collaboration, they had to actually move to another desk or another table. When they did that, it changed their mindset to be more collaborative. And we taught that and we, we instructed them along those things, right? And then of course, some movement always increases engagement. So try to find ways to integrate that into your classroom. Again, it's student-centered. I'm moving as a teacher, I'm doing great. But thinking about from the student perspective, that a little bit of movement can make a big difference in engagement levels, I think is going to be key. You might have had, the, had this experience where a teacher just stops in the middle of the lesson, has everybody stand up, shake it out a little bit, take a break, walk around the room, and then sit back down, right? That little bit of movement can be a game changer for that day's lesson. Okay, 
Next, higher order thinking questions. We talked about moving up that Bloom's taxonomy. Are you asking students to move to those higher order thinking questions? Best practices show that generally on a given day, you should have one to three higher order thinking questions that encourage learning and challenge students a little bit, right? What this does is it focuses your instruction, as we talked about before, and it provides some scaffolding. Every student can answer the question at a level that they're comfortable at, and you can use it as an assessment tool in your classroom to make sure students are making the progress you want them to make. Taking time every single day to summarize your lesson at the close is again a key way to reinforce your learning goal and gives you an opportunity to have students answer those higher order thinking questions. Those one to three questions that you have given them, use those questions as a way to sort of evaluate their learning or to summarize the content. Again, in those summaries, you're signifying to the students, this is your takeaway, or you're asking students to develop and student-centered a takeaway. Again, as a teacher, when we're teacher focused, I can say, hey, I just want to get three more slides in. I wanted to get to this level. But when you think about it from a student perspective, and you understand the importance of summarizing as a way to signify the big takeaway for the day and help students sort of organize the important events that you have taught, then summarizing becomes a key element and you stop your lesson, even if it's a little short of where you wanted to get to, it's not as far, and you spend some time summarizing. Then encouraging desirable rigor in your class in the way that you develop it, right? So what is the pace and what is the depth? That is always a tension, the breadth and the depth that we have to manage as teachers. What's the right pacing for this class? What's the right depth for this class? And when we combine those together and get a desirable rigor, then we have a class that is challenging and rewarding for students. When we focus mostly on pace and not on depth, then we can have something that can sort of result in student burnout where they don't feel like they're really learning anything and they're just trying to keep up and then when we focus too much on depth, then we might get to a point where some students have achieved it and they disengage because they're there and you just keep mining deeper and deeper and deeper. They're like, hey, we're there, let's move on. So identifying that, that balance is key. So every single lesson should be active towards learning. Active is key. How are you making progress towards your learning goals and your learning objectives? Cool. All right, almost done. Make sure it's student-centered. We've been talking about this a lot, but you as a teacher should be the facilitator of learning. That's what best practices show. That doesn't mean you don't teach or you don't lecture. You do, but you do that as a way to facilitate learning of all of your students. In the long run, you're developing 21st century skills. That's your goal. Not just the content. Yes, the content's important, but when we make it student-centered, we look at what skills are we developing that they can take into life as they move forward. Differentiation is key. Students learn in different ways. You and I learn in different ways. So how can I use a variety of learning activities to make sure that all students have an opportunity to learn? This doesn't mean you throw out your instructional design and you just try something new every single time. Choose a design, stick with it, because when students know what to expect, they can start to really gain confidence in your classroom and feel like they can be successful. So you don't want that to be shifting ground underneath their feet all of the time. But what it does mean is I give a variety of ways that they can learn the content. So I can do a lecture, but I can also have a video and I can have additional instructional supports and I can have students engage with the activity and I can have an artistic element of it. Lots of ways for students to engage it. Differentiation is huge within the class and within the course overall. So again, the differentiating with an individual lesson. So what variety of activities can I get in this single lesson? And then differentiating over time to make sure I'm giving students different opportunities to be successful. Then using clear instructional organization. Choose a model of learning that is highly organized around your goals and your questions. Yes, you have flexibility to choose a variety of things. But again, repeating saying, hey, students, here is the process of learning that is going to get you to where you need to be. And making that consistent over the entire class is going to help students know how to be successful in your class, and they all know what is expected of them. And you can continue to refine that and reinforce that over time. When you continually shift your instructional strategies to get there, and you don't have 
clear instructional organization, then students can get lost or feel like I was successful last unit, I'm not successful this unit because I don't understand how to be consistently successful. So they're focusing on trying to identify what you're trying to get them to do rather than focusing on learning the content, if that makes sense. Okay, so there we go. They understand how to be successful. That's a ton of stuff broken down, but in general, that's your section three, a snapshot of a class that is student-centered rather, teacher, rather than teacher-centered and is focusing on helping students achieve those goals. Next is step four, instructional models, the last part of our instructional strategies, best practices.